Welcome to the Aquarium Guys Podcast with your hosts, Jim Colby and Rob Zolson. Hello, listeners. Welcome to the podcast. We're going to dive in today. I have my co-host, Jim Colby. Hey, Robbie. How you doing today? I am doing well. And again, I am your main host, the better host, Robbie Olson. The much better looking host. It's, you know, it's it's not on you. It's on me. What, are you going to give me the five bucks you told me you'd give me for saying that? That's uh, that's from our future sponsor. Oh, okay. We got we to gotta get some of those I first. did not realize that. Well, I appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. We're trying a new format of a podcast. We want to make this podcast uh, essentially evergreen, where it's not necessarily uh, time-stamped, where you can go back and listen to these podcasts to help you out in your aquarist hobby anytime that you want. I know that uh, Jim and I are both enthusiasts of uh, Amazonas. Is that how you say it? Amazonas Magazine? Am- Amazonas Magazine, yeah. So think of it as that content. You know, this content will hopefully uh, help all listeners no matter the time. So we're going to dive in, um, not each week, we're we're unsure in the schedule format, you'll be hearing from us soon, but every so often we want to sit down and do a deep dive. Um, Jim is an expert in uh, tropical fish, wholesaling, breeding, trust me if it's out there he's at least given it a try. How long have you been in the industry, Jim? Almost 30 years now. That's, That's really tailing on... You know uh, how old you are. You don't look that old. Sir. I started when I was seven. Does that help? Months. Seven months. Yeah, seven months. <laughs> seven yeah. months. Bite me. <laughs> Bite me. So I started in my early twenties trying to make some money at it. I was a pure hobbyist up until my early twenties, and I'm now in my later mid fifties here. Let's put it that way. So you know, most kids in their twenties, you know, they try to make money is what uh, start a band. Sell drugs. You're like fish. Fish do it. <laughs> I wish I would have started the band because uh, you know girls, you know, love band. You know. Well, I, I believe that every aquarist out there, you know, their maybe their main hobby or second hobby could be fish, but I'm seeing that everybody that does it has a secondary hobby. Mine, I'm a nerd. You know, I do computers, gaming, Magic the Gathering. You are a rock fan through and through, Jim. Yes, love the rock music. Uh, we spend a lot of money, a lot of time. Uh, following bands around the U.S. We go to a lot of shows. We do uh, a rock cruise every year. And, uh, you know, some people hunt and fish for fun, and and that's what my wife and I enjoy doing is going uh, to rock shows. We meet a lot of uh, the 80s rock stars over the years and uh, become friends with a few of them. And, uh, you know, that's our our love, uh, but also the love is uh, the aquariums. Fantastic. So, again, 30 years, and you, you started to see if you want to make money out of them. I'm assuming, what was the first thing you bred? Well, you know, I was suckered into this whole business by a friend of mine. His name's Steve Larson. And Steve... Uh, shout out. Yeah, shout out for Steve. Hey, how's it going? Hey, How Steve. dare you? Yes. Steve owned a local five and dime show, uh, shop, and, and they sold aquarium fish. And when I was younger... Uh, my mom and I had aquariums, and she had a love for it also, and we raised a lot of guppies. And uh, so I was going into my local shop and talking to Steve, and, and I go, how come you don't have any guppies? And he goes, I can't get them. I can't get them. I can't get them to live. And I'm going, oh, I can raise you guppies. Wrong. Wrong? <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. I lost my first $8,000. I lost eight thousand dollars in guppies in one year. Whoa, whoa, whoa! So let's roll this back. Let's say thirty years ago, yes. right? Yep. How in the hell would guppies cost that much money? How many guppies did you get thirty years ago for eight grand? I'm assuming equipment had to have been involved. Yeah, oh, of course. Um, you know, but why would you just start with a few tanks when you could start with fifty? And that's that was a good starting point in my mind. I'd start with fifty tanks, and then I ran up to uh, a fish wholesaler and got guppies. And uh, that was back when the disease first came through called the Singapore Slu. And what it was, um, depending on who you talk to, gram-negative or gram-positive bacterial infection that guppies got. And people bring guppies in, and most of the guppies are raised in Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, Malaysia, places like that. And they're brought in, but they're getting these gram-positive, gram-negative bacterial infections, which looked 
like a saddle across the top of the fish, and it actually dissolved the bodies. The bo- I mean, it actually would they would fall apart. And you'd have 100 guppies today. You'd have 75 tomorrow. You'd have three on Tuesday. It, um, I killed, didn't kill, I, I did not keep alive 500 guppies the first month. And that's how I went out and spent a bunch of money, got beautiful stock, and brought them home. And that's the same thing that was being experienced by my local uh, pet store that I was buying from. Uh, he would get them in from the suppliers. They'd last about about three to five days once he got them, and then they would just dissolve. And uh, very, very hard to treat. Um, like I said, it was gram-negative or gram-positive bacterial infection that they would get, and they had to be treated. And by the time you treated them, uh, you still have a 40%, 50% loss. And uh, so after about uh, a full year, I was $8,000 in the hole. And so that was the first thing I tried raising. Uh, when I was raising them in high school... So, whoa, whoa, let's stop there. $8,000 in the hole, there was this uh, infection that I heard of. And what was the name of it again? Well, they, 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 they called it the Singapore Slu. So, I've only heard this once before. Okay. And I have this extremely old book that my grandmother gave me. Because, again, it, our families are the ones that get us into the hobby most yes. of the time. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe you just thought it was cool at a pet store. But my grandmother was to blame. And this book, it's all in black and white. It was like one of the original fish manuals for tropical fish. I mean, it has instructions from like Victorian era aquariums, you know, giving history back of how aquariums started and all kinds of shit. Love that stuff. And she had handwritten notes. And on the leaves with a few live bears, she had that um, bacteria written down. So that's all was was a note susceptible to this. And she wrote it down in the book. I never knew what it was. Yeah, it it was incredible. And it took um, basically years for it to get cleaned up over overseas. And, And... from what I understand, and I don't know if there's any truth of the matter, is that they were actually keeping formaldehyde, which is highly carcinogenic, in the water to try to kill this bacteria that was killing the guppies. And once they got into fresh water and they weren't into their treated water, which they were you know, trying to breed them in, that's when they would come over here. Uh, you know, they're, they're shipped over. It takes probably about three days to get them from, say, Sri Lanka. They'll fly them into LAX Airport in Los Angeles. Then they'll move them into uh, Minneapolis, Minneapolis to our local airport here. And uh, it's a lot of stress on the fish, and they break down real quick. And so what I thought was going to be a slam dunk uh, was basically driving into the ditch. <laughs> it was a terrible, terrible deal. So there was no Florida back then. You know, that's that's a, a part of it. Uh, Florida did not really do any of that because there are certain fish that can be um, – that are so – I guess the word I'm looking for, it, there's so much work for culling. Uh, you know, like when you go into looking at koi, I mean, we've talked about koi in the past and, and how to get, you know, a, a, a hundred good koi, you might cull through 2,000. And um, that's the same thing in Florida. They, they were having uh, uh, the problems at that time uh, with all the bent fins, or the bent backs, I'm sorry. And uh, and that was a calcium deficiency that was... Uh, they weren't able to take care of. So once it hit the Orient, then Florida stepped up and started to breed guppies, but not enough guppies to matter, to be honest. It was very hard to get them. And once you got them in, um, you know, and you're able to keep them alive, you had to put them into, you couldn't put them in any tanks that these former guppies had been in without basically taking the tank down, drying it out, and bleaching it. Because this, this stuff was, uh, that was killing these guppies where it would just live in the tank forever. So for those that don't know, Florida, especially if you're not in like the fish business, Florida is the hot spot for farm-raised fish. It's been the hot spot for many years, and it's really boomed out what we say, what, in the 90s? Yeah. I mean, they, they were doing it back in the in the early 50s. They, they started doing it. And uh, you and I have been in Florida together. We, we've been to uh, several of the farms. And uh, and see how they, they do it down there. And it's very basic. It's very simple. And they don't throw a lot of money at the problem. And that's the one thing I learned after losing the eight grand the first year in guppies. I contacted another company where I was able to buy just normal fish. Because now I'm, I, I want to sell just regular fish, say bettas and platies and swords, just to try to get my money back. I mean, that's where I was at, at that point going, I need to get my money back on this. Interesting. Most people will be like, eight grand? Nah, I got burnt. I learned my lesson. I'm out. But uh, that shows that it's a hobby above all else and then money. 
Well, it's it's kind of like, you know, have you ever seen a, a bar fight where somebody gets the crud beat out of them, and they're laying on the floor, and they've totally been beaten up, and they look up and go, is that all you got? That's kind of what I'm doing there. So you're, you're just making a point. <laughs> I feel like mom had to be involved. Like, Jimmy, why are you doing that? And you just had to prove her wrong. Like, I'm going to make money at this shit, Mom. Yeah, well, you're going, how can I not make any money at this? I mean, this, is, this is, should be simple. It's freaking guppies, for goodness sakes. I mean, next to sea monkeys. I'm thinking that uh, and goldfish. <laughs> that's got to be the most popular, at least now. Yes. You know, uh, sea monkeys, uh, on back when I was growing up, was on the back of every comic book. And basically, you get a little bit of brine shrimp. In a package, you put it in salt water, and it hatches, and you sit there with your mouth open going, isn't this cool? No, then they get a bacteria on their back, and they dissolve. Yes. That's, <laughs> that's guppies. <laughs> that's what happens. Exactly. Well, that's uh, that's fantastic. No, my uh, my intro, again, is from my grandmother, and I just want to point out, I am 29 years old, and when I started getting into fish, everybody, of course, had guppies, and they were very different in the 90s. Uh, they were different in the 2000s. They actually had color. Females had color, and they were much bigger. They have definitely been stunted down in the last 15, 20 years. Um, I mean, we have pictures of these things, and it's just not at all what I'm used to. They used to, if, for anybody that wants to look this up, if they want to look up the size of like a female mosquito fish, imagine that with color for a female guppy. Just a big two full inches, just a big old fish. Yeah, you used to be able to take a, a, a nickel and sometimes a quarter and lay it on their tail. I mean, that's how big their tail was. Big, beautiful, bright colors. And uh, basically, after the Singapore slew, everybody kind of had to sit back, scratch their head, and start over. And when they finally found some wild-caught guppies, they started over. And, of course, um, in the wild-caught guppies aren't as big, um, not as bright and beautiful. So, But now, look at where we're at now, and, and you go on Aquabid and that sort of place, and you're seeing $75, $150 for a trio of guppies. You know, absolutely gorgeous, but, man, somebody spent a lot of time a lot of effort uh, producing those guppies. And just to dive in, I'm going to pause on a couple different notes along the entire podcast. I just want this friendly for everybody, not just experts of the fish hobby. So Aquabid is essentially the eBay of fish trading and selling. So if you want, as a private breeder, have your own select stock, and you want to essentially sell your fish to good parties that have a nice middleman, you use Aquabid. It protects you, it, uh, the seller, it protects the, the buyer. And it does have extra costs and fees to it, but again, it's the safest way to buy small private bids online. There's, of course, industries, there's uh, um, other stores you can buy from, but from private party, it's the eBay of fish selling. Absolutely. It's fantastic for the hobbyists, especially, let's say you're a basement breeder of guppies and you're looking And you're for, trying to prove your mom wrong. That's right. And, you, and you're going, I got eight Gs to get rid of right now. Oh, shit. And why drive to the casino? I'm just going to sit here and throw it down the toilet. Let's just get that done. <laughs> Let's get her done, dude. Oh, man. No, uh, so um, thanks for that deep dive. But I'm, my bio, again, my, my grandmother got me into it. She had a 75-gallon above uh, her fireplace. And my grandma was a bit nutty when it came to uh, fish breeding. She has uh, notes all the way back from the 60s. She's uh, done it most of her life back when it wasn't cool. And she's got notes of... All kinds of rare species, a couple of species that don't really exist in the hobby anymore. And I cherish these books she gave me, and I've just really kind of spun off of that. I've had a lot of different uh, species, and I pride myself as an expert in freshwater fish specifically. I've definitely dabbled in salt, but, you know, I learned quickly that fish a hobby can be very expensive. And keeping it cheap may be an idea for business, but I also want to do it for growing up. I grew real poor. So... You know, if you had a, a tank that was broken, I would seal it up. Anything I could do to uh, get it working. So my grandmother gave me a lot of her equipment. I got to see her breed uh, betas um, uh, in the 90s. And she actually would breed them together and grow them up by the pair so she could sell two males together before, you know, people would realize they'd rip each other apart. If they're bred together from a small size, you can keep them together. And it was just amazing what she could do. And I was just really inspired by that. So I've I dove in. Uh, Jimmy and I are friends, actually, because of the fish hobby. We saw each other in a local grocery store, and he saw me getting a bunch of RO water and thought I was nuts. What are you doing? I'm like, I'm filling a tank. And Jim and I have been friends ever since, and we've done uh, business ventures together. We have both uh, wholesale uh, tropical fish and really want to use this podcast to share our expertise. 
And, you know, just to humble myself, I'm going to uh, say my uh, my saddest moment is having, you know, like a freshwater black arowana, not Asian, it's not illegal, it's a South American fish, getting eaten by a uh, high-bred uh, tiger catfish. That was my highlight of my day when that happened. I had pictures. <laughs> the, the, the arowana <laughs> was twice the size of the damn catfish and ate the son of a bitch whole. I, I think somebody said, I don't know if that's a good idea, Robbie. I don't know who that was, but no, it couldn't have been, couldn't have been anyone because they they had they had measuring sticks. Yes, yeah, yes. that was a sad sad day when I had to give you a little crying tall there. It was a very sad day, but no, we've all had uh, a lot of uh, experience, and uh, we just want to go over these podcasts and do a species deep dive. And I'd say every hobbyist that's been as long as I, especially as long as Jimmy has, you know, we have our favorites and our expertise. And I really want to dive into your expertise, uh, Jimmy. Um, you are the king of angelfish. I'd like to think that, and and uh, but I'm really not. There's so many people out there that do such a wonderful job, and um, I really love the angelfish. It's just been my favorite fish ever since day one. Um, I've tried discus. Uh, I've got my butt handed to me on that on a couple occasions. Uh, right now, we've currently got discus again, doing well. Uh, listening to people, you, you know, the, the best advice that anybody can give you, and I'll, I'll tell you this really quick. I was down in Florida after my $8,000 kick in the pants. and I was Hopefully ta- mom paid for your ticket. No, I, I charged it because what else? Oh, you, you know, oh. you got eight G's on, on, on the uh, credit card. What's Double that? down. You're in <laughs> Vegas, baby. <laughs> exactly. And uh, so I went down there, and uh, there's a gentleman down there that, that – took me under his wing and I'll and I love him to death he's still alive but he's he's an older gentleman and and his name's Paul Norton and it used to be Norton Tampa Bay Fisheries and his specialty was tiger barbs cherry barbs garamis and um here when I first started I put a lot of money into my fish room because everybody wants a beautiful fish room and you want a light on every tank you want every tank to look good you know and uh, so I go over, I go down to, uh, down to Tampa and uh, I got educated and, you know, I tell my children, I've got, I got two adult boys and, and I, I give them this advice all the time that Paul Norton gave me. And he says, you know, the best advice I can give it to you is, is learn from other people's mistakes because it's a lot cheaper. And I went, wow, you know, where were you a year ago? And he, he said, you know, he said, Jim, you can keep a healthy fish healthy, but by God, it's heckin' back to try to get a sick fish healthy. He said, so you, when you get them in, he says, you want to treat them like they're sick. You want to hit them with the antibiotics. You want to hit them with the uh, medicine, uh, whatever you're treating with. Uh, every fish, of course, is different. We can get into that later on. But um, so anyway, when I went down to Paul, uh, he educated me. He showed me what he was doing. And it was so simple, Robbie. So simple, what he was doing. He, whoa, whoa. Are you sure you don't want to like save this for your book later that you're going to yeah, write? Yeah, my, my book of how to lose $8,000 in a year <laughs> without going to Vegas. Yeah. No, um, you know, you, you go into these greenhouses, and uh, they've got blocks, bricks, what do you call them? Cinder blocks? I'd say cinder blocks. Yeah, Definitely cinder, cinder blocks. blocks. They've got cinder blocks with... Uh, wood across with tanks sitting on top and they've got the cheapest sponge filters you've ever seen you wouldn't use them if you if you you wouldn't pay 10 cents for them they look terrible i swear to god it looks like they cut them out of like a chevy caprice's like cushion seat exactly that had been sat on for 30 years oh yeah and uh they're falling apart half eaten they're chunky you definitely tell they're not manufactured they're ripped apart right i mean these guys have made these these filters and what was really interesting is that uh, he took, took me through the whole tiger barb thing, which is which was uh, interesting as heck. I, I'm not a fan of tiger barbs, but watching him breed these things, um, they're breeding at that time twelve thousand a week, out of a room probably twenty by thirty. And on the other end of the room, they were doing grammies. So basically, half that space they're doing twelve thousand fish a week, and you're going cha ching. I can make back my money. Wrong. 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 So but, you, you took these ideas, and how did you start with angels? 
Well, I, I, one of my uh, stores said, well, can, you, can you get me some angels? And I said, yeah, I can bring them in. And so I, at that time, I was starting to uh, bring fish in from overseas. Uh, overseas does a okay job with angelfish, but they come in thin, weak. You have to uh, get the parasites out of them because most of them are in ponds and stuff. And so it quickly came to me that I wanted to breed my own and have a healthier fish. And so what I did is, once again, back to my uh, local pet store, and everything you read on the internet says, hey, you want to raise angelfish, go out and buy a dozen and let them grow up. Have you ever, ever seen those articles, Rob? Oh, yeah. And, and you don't have that kind of time. I mean, why would you go out and, and, and wait six months to start breeding fish when you can go out and buy adults from somebody else? And I think that we should, you know, take some time, go into a deep dive about how the, you know, hobbyists can actually make money and what is a better investment. But if you're go make dollars, growing a fish from small to big, that's where the money's lost. Is essentially you want them in a nice small size, they're easily shipped, and if you have issues with them, it's definitely going to be something long term. Maybe the power went out once. Maybe there's a lot of variables, and as soon as you get them to size, out they go. Right. You know, there is no money in raising an angelfish to an adult size unless you're doing it for yourself because it's something you want genetically. You know, and, and so basically if you're doing it to make Or a, if you had that mystical blue one that doesn't exist. That's right. You know, or the glow-in-the-dark ones, which they have overseas that you can see on the Internet. They're like the glowfish, but they're glow angels. Well, well, well we'll get to that soon. Back oh, to your point. I've been trying to get those for years. Nobody will give them to me. I wonder why. Because they're illegal in this country. But anyway, um, so my I went to one of my local pet stores, and they I, fir- I saw my first pair of pearl scale gold angelfish adults. And it was uh, like you bought your first porn mag. Yeah. Oh man, I sat there and just drooled on the tank, and and to me at the time, Michael Jackson was big. I'm not a Michael Jackson fan, but who is? But anyway. Michael, I mean, it looked like the sequence of his glove. I've never seen the pearl scale before at this point in my life. And the pearl scale variation, that carries out to other fish, just for the listeners that are, are in. It's literally segments that reflect in the size of either small circular or diamond shapes across the scales, and they're highly reflective. It literally looks like they're glistened across the fish. Some other mollies have carried uh, around hybrids of pearl scale. It's not that they're crossed. It's just that's the style of the body of the fish. A lot of goldfish, a lot of fancy goldfish coming in that are coming in pearl scale now. And uh, not to the extent of, of like what you see on an angelfish, but it's it's they're that's what they're breeding for. You know, they want a showy fish so they can get more money. And it's all about when the, when the, these breeders overseas, it's all about you know if I can get a nickel more fish and I'm selling ten thousand, well that's a lot of money, especially from overseas. Mommy, mommy, I want the shiny one. Exactly. And so uh, I bought my first pair of angelfish for fifty bucks. For the pair, it was a mated pair. They're laying eggs. These particular people uh, had three pair, and I said, I'll, "I'll take a pair for fifty bucks." Never had an angel fish up to this point. No, no, other than maybe in the tank here and there. And, I'm not going to start the small ones. I'm just going to go in for the you know big oh, expensive pair. Yeah, and, and and fifty bucks then was that was thirty years ago. That's thirty folks. years ago. Thirty years ago, folks. I mean, inflation's huge. That's probably ten grand. <laughs> Let's get it. It's like another eight thousand dollars down the crapper. My lord. <laughs> So anyway, what, what uh, I did, I took them home. I listened for once. I listened to somebody else, and they told me what to do. And I had my first spawn in about 10 days. And I sat there in the dark watching the angelfish spawn. And at that point, I was hooked. You're in. Absolutely You're hooked. sold. So let's, let's take that a moment and talk about how they spawn. So, again, these are essentially a elongated um, fish from the cichlid family. They're semi-aggressive. You can have them with other fish, but again, when they're paired, they easily fight for their territory. So how, start I start at the beginning, How what was the information you were given? How do they breed? Well, it, you know, first I was told, I said, you know, don't put them in with anything else. Don't put them in with a pleco or an algae eater. I've got a story about don't ever put algae eaters in with your with your angelfish. Um, once upon a time, I, when I had 30 pairs of angelfish, the tanks were getting kind of scummy looking, so I, on a Friday night, as I'm leaving to go for the weekend, I threw two or three algae eaters in each tank, 
and left for the weekend and came back and found uh, 18 out of my 30 pairs, at least one of them dead, because the algae eaters love the body slime off an angelfish. And so apparently that's more delicious than algae. Well, especially when they're breeding. Again, yes. they're, they're pretty close to a discus. Yes. And the discus are notorious for the only fish that really, uh, freshwater fish, that nurse. They actually feed the slime off their body when they're breeding to the little ones. Yeah. So they're very close to the family. So when they're breeding like that, they're going to be tasty. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, get your pair. Uh, you don't need a large tank. Uh, I've used a lot of 10s. Most people want to use 20s. But it all depends on the size. I mean, I've had angelfish that have bread that are the size of a little bit bigger than a 50-cent piece, body-wise. But most of them, you know, are, are about the size of the palm of your hand when they start breeding. They need to be about nine months of age when they start breeding. And and uh, they're very hard to determine, the males from the females, until they actually show their breeding tubes. So the way that you taught me, because again, I got uh, angels, um, I had a couple before, but I never bred them, never grew them up. I had someone that wanted them, they were wanting to get in their own hobby, so I pawned them off. But how I got deep into it and giving breeding a try myself, you showed me that, again, if I remember correctly, the males have a nice bump on their head, generally yeah, speaking. Generally speaking. And the females, they definitely lack that and also can be just a hair smaller, but they're fatter, generally speaking. Yes. And, and then, so you'll see them, you know, Let's say you've got a dozen adult angelfish. If you take a dozen angelfish in a 55-gallon tank and you put in breeding slates, which is a slate probably 2 by two inches by 12 inches. And uh, and when you say slate, it's actually, you know, I've seen different objects. It's something that's textured. Normally, they actually do use slate rock. If you can get yes. that cut at a hardware store, that's what you see, and especially in the international breeders. That's a cheap way of getting them bred. You don't have to find a log or some natural setting that you have to spend a ton of money for. They literally have just a slate rock cut in that, that shape. Yeah. A lot of people sell them. A lot of people I know use like a, a kind of a plastic slate. I prefer, like you said, the real rock slate. And It's cheaper. It's much cheaper. And there's all kinds of people out there on the internet selling slates, but I, if you want to you want to do it the cheap way, um, I went to my local hardware store, uh, big box store, and bought 12 inch tile slate. And I went home. I bought a closeout on a diamond saw, which you can cut slate with because slate is very very soft. And um, I went home and I made my own. Uh, two by twelve. Two by twelves. Yeah, I cut I cut six out of them out of each one for about forty cents a piece, I think, at the time. And I've seen a lot of weird stuff. You go, especially Aquabid. You'll have all these, you know, how do we say, uh, high class breeders right. telling you that nope, the only way to do it is doing it like this. And I've seen crazy shit where they have a you know, PVC pipe stuffed with almond leaves that's been literally sanded to have texture. No, just go get a tile, make it rock slate, make it cheap, and make it dark because. Um, here's what happens with PVC, and I've used PVC and I've had success with it. But when they lay the opaque eggs on the PVC pipe, you can't see it very well. And you'll have a pair that'll be sneaky as snot, and they'll do it on the back side, and and you won't notice because uh, PVC is being completely around. Whereas with the slate, if you take the slate and you lean it up against the glass, and I usually do it on the end. Then they, they, I've never had one go underneath and lay. They've always laid it on, on the top. And what's nice about the slate is a piece of slate like that will easily fit in a one-gallon jar if you're going to artificially raise them, which I prefer doing. Um, that is the best way. So to not uh, skip some steps, so we have the slate. It's, again, 12 by 2. You set it up against the side of the glass, arced, so it's not really a tent, but just leaning up against the kind glass. Kind of a 45-degree angle, yeah. Right. So they come, and they, they breed on them, and again, the female lays, the male follows behind with the, the what, silt, sperm. Yes. I mean, come on, this is a fun episode. It's it's jizz. They're, it is. They're going to jizz it, right it, all over just, that shit. It's just a bad porn movie. Just going to blow the load all <laughs> over the thing. <laughs> and now, you said before, dark slate, so you can see the eggs. So I've had people like, well, who cares? You can use a flashlight. You'll find it on whatever device. But it comes to the fact when you pull these things out, like you're just about beginning to say, when you're monitoring the eggs, you'll see that they're opaque. They're almost see-through. And when they go bad, they go bright white. 
That's Correct. When they, they die, and immediately you're going to have issues with egg fungus, which is very common for any fish you have bred. Right. There, I've, I've had some pairs, not many, and at one time I had over 100 pair at one time. And I had one pair that would always be about 100%, and you wouldn't have to really worry about that. But most of them are probably about 70% that they get that they get uh, fertilized. And within jeepers, 12, 18 hours, I've seen them start turning white. And then a good, if you leave the eggs in with the parents, a good pair will start eating the white eggs. Yeah, I've seen where they, they pick them. I just thought it was like, oh, God, they're eating your eggs and you're panicking. I know, you freak out. Nope, they, they more or less know what they're doing. There are such things as inexperienced pairs where it's the first time they bred and they do weird shit. Yep. You know, angelfish are one of the weird things that they'll have, you know, one female and, you know, three males on a rare occasion they don't pair up correctly. They'll have, you know, one of the weird homosexual fish where they just have a slate and they'll both just milt on it with no eggs. But for the most part, if you have a pair that has done it more than once, if they're picking, leave them alone. Right. And I've had, uh, um, going back to the 55 and I was trying to pair off my own pairs at one time, at one time, which I, uh, which I prefer to do. I had a, a several trios and you know, those goddamn females would get in sync and both females would lay eggs at the same time. And the, I'd have one male that would go up behind and fertilize them. And so you'd get a thousand eggs on one slate. And there was a study on this um, done by um, a bunch of different breeders that was uh, publicized in a few different books. And this cycle, again, it's like a 14-day gestation period between breed cycles. And one would start, and again, you have the hormones in the water, everybody else would. Mm -hmm. And you'll see a lot, a lot of the breeders will, will want to uh, plumb all their tanks together just so that you know goes through. I found, um, you know, I always worry about disease. And, uh, you know, if you have one pair go bad, you don't want them taking everybody else down because they get something. We've all been experienced. Where we get something brand new. We're excited. We don't quarantine it like we should. Dump it in. Dump it in. Watch it get eaten by a fucking catfish. Catfish. Yeah. That, still kind of a sore, sore spot, isn't it, Rob? God damn it, Jimmy. How, how much money was that arowana? So uh, about the angels, let's keep on <laughs> subject here. It was many. It was not eight grand, all right? So <laughs> shut your mouth and keep going. <laughs> it was a lot of money, and Robbie cried. I'm just saying. But anyway, um, what I what I prefer to do is I, I prefer to pull the eggs. Some people love to have uh, angelfish that parent raise, which is a beautiful thing to watch and stuff. But if, if you're doing it to make money, if you're doing it to get numbers, Everybody's going to tell you that you should pull the eggs and hatch them yourself. And again, when you're doing these angelfish, because they're so close to discus, they will, on some occasions, um, brood the fish. They, they're not going to, you know, necessarily nurse the fish like a discus, but they will protect their area. They will swim around them, especially if you're well fed. But the better, uh, bigger problem with doing that is not just the risk of what the parents could do, because again, maybe the parents are inexperienced, but. It's more of you have to crank the heat on these tanks to a nice degree for them to breed. And then the moment one of the eggs die, the fungus goes faster than they'll pick out. Absolutely. So it'll easily wipe out half the eggs before they even start hatching, minus the parents trying to, you know, pick off the dead ones. Right. And then once they get, they get frustrated, I've had them just walk away from the eggs and just watch the whole batch go bad. So but by pulling them and putting them in a, a gallon jar, a two and a half gallon tank... The more water you can give them, the the, the more success you're going to have. Now, I, I've, I must uh, stop you one more time. You've you've uh, shown me, you know, do it the cheap way, learn from everybody else's experiences. And generally when I'm going online, I'm seeing these breeding. They have separate tanks. They have separate sponge filters. It's an entire ecosystem they've done. Number one, it's not the same water. You're risking that. You're putting them into another tank. They could get contaminated. And just that change easily kills eggs. Oh. So... Bad number one. Yeah, pH, temperature, anything. So you said put them in a gallon container. So what you do, and I've seen you do this quite a few times, is you have a massive collection of old pickle glass gallon jars. And when I say pickle, go to your local Walmart. Go into the bulk foods area, and you'll see a giant glass gallon jar of elastic pickles. You've collected these. I don't know where you got it. Maybe you have a pickle fetish. And he saves these things, cleans them out, and lets them, of course, dry out, treats them to make sure that they don't have vinegar left in them. And he's been reusing these pickle jars forever. So he takes the water that the parents are in, so no change. 
you put the slit in there, which fits the 12 inches exactly, and then you fizz the hell out of them with bubbles. Yes. And you can treat the jar with uh, methylene blue or whatever else you want to do for egg fungus. Yeah. You know, there's, there's several people uh, that do different things. Everybody has success with what they do. Um, I always use methane blue. A lot of people don't like methane blue for the fact that it stains. And if you've seen my pickle jar collection, they're, they're all, all blue. They're all blue. And, um, you know, right now, if you try to go out and buy one gallon pickle jars, they run you about $6 a piece if you go on the internet to buy them. What I did is... It's eight pickles. Uh, yeah. No, I didn't eat pickles. I went to my local recycling guy and said, hey, do you guys ever get any gallon jars? And they said, all the time. I said, hey, I'll buy you lunch if you can save them for me. They had 150 of them in two weeks. They just... So, let me get this right. You you bribe the guy with lunch. Yes. And he just, like, dumpster dives for pickle jars? No, it's a recycling shop where everybody brings in their recycling. You know, where they sell the aluminum cans and gotcha. they bring in the glass jars. And and so, my cost of 150 jars were zero. Well, I mean, let's see, it's... This was what fifteen years ago, yeah. so six ninety five at Denny's. Yeah, exactly. Actually, it was a couple of Domino's pizzas, but I, I oh, that's I, still cheap. I followed through. You know, tip your recycle guy because he's broke. Yeah. So, but but I love gal- uh, glass gallon jars. A lot of people use um, want to use the plastic ones, but you can't see what's going on. I tried that because again, I, I want to see if there's some other better method. And I had these. We we live in a factory town in Minnesota here, and we have this candy store and they have these plastic containers but the plastic containers didn't hold up at all they crack and above all else if you're trying to use any uh, uh, chemical you can actually wipe the blue off on the glass uh, jars you can't do that to any plastic it stains everything and, and then the more that you try to clean the plastic the more you scratch it up the worse oh, it looks absolutely so 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 what i'd like to do is use the, the gallon pill jar you put the slate in and then you put a air stone I'm sorry, let's back up. When you put the eggs in, put the eggs face down. It's still at a 45-degree angle, but you put the eggs face down, and you put the the little uh, bubbler, the little... The air stone. The air stone. I'm sorry, I just drew a blank. Yeah, you draw the, the air stone underneath it, and the methane blue will uh, then rotate in there nice and keep the oxygen levels very high, and then you can take and... Um, Watch the eggs kind of from underneath, and as they hatch, and they hatch within about 48 hours, if you keep them at about 78 degrees, 48 hours you'll have baby fish. And the reason that is is not necessarily because you want to just spread the chemical around. Most open-faced eggs need fanning. They need oxygen because they absorb it through the outside of the egg. Yes. So if you see, especially cichlid families, you'll have mouth brooders, which will clutch them in their mouth. And that, again, they'll just fan their gills, making sure the eggs get full-on water flow around them for oxygen. If you see discus or angelfish, they will sit and fan and take turns and fan the eggs to make sure they get the oxygen to them. So you're just essentially uh, imitating this. And, well, I was blown away, you know, and learned from other people's uh, mistakes and experiences, is you just turn that thing up. Yeah. Like, you fizz the damn jar. It's like you're just blowing a hose through it. Yep, I like to I like to keep it at a, at a pretty high rate. Uh, the water's not boiling, but if you use a fine air stone, you'll keep it on there. And once you see see the baby starting to uh, thread out, which I call when the tail comes out and stuff, they'll sit there and they're still adhesive. They're still kind of sticky, and they'll stick to that slate. And after they hatch, I usually like to wait for like about. And and here's another uh, thing: you want to write down exactly when they were laid. And that's when your clock starts. And it's it's within reason. You know, people have a damn day, day, day job. You see them at home. Guess right. what? They, they did it today. You have a mark right. that it was during the day. Yeah. And, and if they're all done, they probably got done, you know, four hours ago. Right. But you take a piece of masking tape, you put it on the jar of the time and date, because this comes really important when all of a sudden you've got 25 spawns and you're going, God, who laid this when? And they're all blue jars. No way to make right. sure. And it looks like a bad experiment going on down in somebody's meth lab. You know, I mean, if you used to come down there where I had it, what I did is I, I made myself a, it was probably three feet by eight foot and six inches deep. And that's where all my jars sat in. And then they sat in six inches of water and that water was heated. So rather than running one heater in every jar, I ran one heater for 50 jars and I put a um, little 
air stone in that, which kind of rotated the water through there. And so with one cheap heater, I could run 50 jars is what I could put in there. And now we we got to remember we need to you know talk to the other audience as well. So he, you're putting labels on just because again you're trying to essentially do a small farm on these. Right. That's but right. let's say I'm just a hobbyist. I have a 20 gallon tank. I love angels and I have a pair. Right. You know they're going to spawn every 14 days at least. And sometimes they'll do split spawns. So if you have say a slate or two slates because they're going to pick out a spot, they'll spawn. Um, you know, the first day, and then they'll respawn with the remainder of the eggs and another. So it's a rare situation, but it does happen. So putting a label on those jars even matters when you have one or two pairs. Absolutely. And I, I've had, um, especially if you have your fish in a community tank, if they are in the middle of laying and they get distracted defending that area, they will quit spawning, like Rob just said. And then they'll probably spawn later on once they get whatever fish is bothering them away and i've seen it where i pull, pull the slate out figure they're done spawning and then suddenly you'll have it on the side of the glass or you'll have it on heaven forbid you know you're over the hanging back filter or even worse on the damn glass heater oh yeah and that does nothing but make a nice smelly mess it's gross yeah and so you know the whole thing is if you're trying to do it to make some money you you want to save as many babies as you can because Later on down the line, you're still going to be culling for bent fins and, and deformities, which you always have. And uh, so the whole theory of it is to try to save as many fish as you can. Because if you're, if you're going to be selling at the pet store, you want to have a, a large amount. Because most pet stores will take 25 to 50 a week. And, you know, this is not necessarily like that one store that maybe have has fish in the back. This is a, a pet store. It right, is dedicated a... to pets. It's something that they that is their market. So that that's definitely, it can't even be a low rate for that, that amount. Oh, yeah. Because I mean, angelfish is like a bread and butter fish. Just like your guppies, platies, and swords. And coming from a couple of, you know, um, wholesalers and online sellers, the bread and butter fish are, you know, like you said, the barbs, your oh. angelfish. You have your basic sharks, even though we highly discourage those in a lot of cases, unless you have a sufficient area. Goldfish, neon tetras, and uh, I think guppies, angelfish. Right. You know, just the, what, the stuff that you'd normally see, even though Walmart now shut down. Yay. Applause. Yay. Applause. But the stuff that you normally see at like those retail shops that they would have. Yeah, it's just amazing the um, how how much fish that that a small store will go through I, I was just simply amazed um i've got stores right now that you you drive by and go oh, they're not doing any business and they're selling 40 bettas a week and uh, it's just simply amazing so just to dive in a little bit further you got a bunch of jars going or maybe a jar and the first thing that happens is they hatch and you have wrigglers in the bottom and once we got got wigglers you've got about and when we say wrigglers, you'd be surprised and you look down and you're like, what the hell is that? They literally still look like eggs with a black dot on them, which is their eyeball. And then you suddenly see like a little thing flicker on them. Yes. It's literally no change. It's amazing how small they are. Yeah. You almost need to take the, the air stone out, take a pen flashlight, shine down there, and you'll see that they're all stuck together because they're still all sticky and they'll be in one clump and there'll be 200 tails sticking out of there. And those will sit down there, and, and they'll vibrate for another probably three to four days. And then all of a sudden, you'll come one afternoon, one morning, and you'll look in there, and you'll have 300 little fish. And that time frame, I've I, I seen that does change with heat. So yes, colder, slower, heat. And we're not saying crank your heat up when it's in the jar. Keep it stable, because you want these to live. You're not caring about... Is it going to give cut another 12 hours off? You know, keep your heat stable, but again, that does change it. So if you had a 90-degree tank, now these are brooding 90 degrees, it may be two days. Right. And the other thing you, you really want to watch for is you don't feed any of these fish until they're up and free swimming in a cloud, like a mosquito cloud or, a, you know, you've seen clouds of bugs. And until they come up, they are still absorbing their, their yolk sac. And you have to realize that, they are getting fed with their yolk sac, and they still are, are dropping uh, their excrement in the water. So you have to do water changes in these jars. So now you have a, a blue jar at 48 hours, and, and they're wiggling on the bottom. And day three, you need to do probably a 20% water change because there is no filter in there. 
And you got to be careful when you do this water change. It's best to use either a neighboring jar or, you know, even though we're introducing, again, it's a separate tank, grab from mom and dad's tank, especially if you kept it the same temperature. That's what matters the most is the temperature. So even if you have to, you know, grab that water, put it in a separate jar, bring the temperature up, make sure you're monitoring it, and then do the water change because this is the most crucial th- uh, time that you'll lose stock. Yes, and then you have to be on top of it every day. You, you, you need to do that 20% water change. And as you do this throughout the week, you'll see that the, the jars that you've been doing the water change on now are getting clearer and clearer and clearer. And then once they're up and free swimming in a cloud, that's when you start feeding the live baby brine shrimp, which you have to hatch. And, you know, for those that are intimidated, oh, brine shrimp, it's not that hard. We'll certainly post some in, instructions um, further, but... Yeah, once they're once they're free forming, I, I when I did it, I still gave them you know a day before I feed them, and then day two after they after they're free swimming for uh, for the second day, that's when I give them food. Yep, you, you can just you know you'll get really good at it. You'll be able to look and see that their belly is totally absorbed because the yolk sac is kind of a pale yellow, and it'll eventually become uh, you know gone and it'll, it'll look like a little baby guppy, and you start feeding them, and after two weeks, they'll, they'll start developing and looking like a little angelfish, and they're absolutely cute as a button. So, again, from brine shrimp to crush flake. Yep. So, uh, and then most of the breeders will stay on brine shrimp on, like, a, uh, every other feeding. Most people feed two or three times a day when you've got small fish like that. Um, and this is for the sake of trying to raise fish as fast as they can. For a uh, private breeder... You can still sit that twice a day. You know, it may be risk once a day. It's this is a, a hobby. You want them to grow long term. Yeah, and the thing is, is that they'll they're pretty resilient. The angelfish. If you're doing this to discus, the discus breeders who are artificially raising the discus are feeding six to eight times a day, and um, and that's over in the Orient, over the Tony Tan people, and the different discus breeders and stuff. And and I've done just deep research and. For the hobbyist, for if you're gonna do discus, about the only way to you know to do it is if you're at home all the time for the first three weeks to get them going. But and angel- that's if you're not nursing them either, right? With mom and dad, right? Most people that are doing it overseas are are pulling the the eggs, right? Especially when you're talking that kind of money for those type of fish. Well, fantastic! That gives us a a real picture. And um, I know before you had grow out tanks. You know, once they got wriggled, after you give them a week, you put them all together. You batch brine together there's ways uh ways of doing it but again for the hobbyist use the jar use the slates move it into an independent tank wait for the wrigglers feed brine shrimp two weeks roughly and you should be set right and then uh, flake food the highest protein flake food that you can find out there and there's a lot of great food out there now um this is where we normally would insert in a sponsor <laughs> yeah so uh please contact us use the uh, <laughs> email in the podcast I'm pretty sure Capital One will probably call me and say, hey, you still owe us that eight grand. No, Not sponsored him. by Capital One. <laughs> I paid him. Thank God. But, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a wonderful hobby. It is so satisfying when you've got a tank full of 300 baby fish and uh, people come over to your house and go, holy God dang, that is beautiful. And uh, I like swimming speckles. They're cool. Yeah. You know, and and – Getting into the breeding aspect, I mean, there's so many different colors and varieties and different things you can do. There's people that, that have been working for 30 years just on koi angelfish, which are an angelfish with a lot of orange on them. So the angelfish started out, um, again, we're pulling a lot of this because uh, there's a lot of breeding knowledge-based resources. Wikipedia does do a good job. However, there's a ton of stuff lacking on normal fish. The bread and butter fish that we told you about earlier, there's a lot of data on. So trust Wikipedia when they do have a resource because, again, you can go back and see where the resource came from. But the aquatic hobby, again, started originally as a big to-do in the 1920s. So people didn't know what to do. They took them out of their natural environments. They knew that they needed oxygen, and they went from there. There wasn't essentially scientists making sure we have all the data on these fish as we did the hobby. They just, will it work? Will people buy them? Who cares? And they started uh, figuring out how to breed along the way. So this has been a hobbyist passion through and through since the 1900s. Oh, you know, if you look back in, into you know back ancient Chinese, and you see some of the, the goldfish that they used to keep in bowls, and they were doing water changes, you know, twice a day to keep, and that was for royalty. Royalty was keeping goldfish. Nobody else was. Yeah. So it's 
the the modern Aquarius hobby has been done uh, just during this period of time, and there you know there's exceptions, and it's mainly um, the wealthy. You'll see the Victorian era or aquariums with literally lead casings and all kinds of crazy shit in museums. But as far as the hobby goes, documenting started in 1900, worked up the way popular 1920 worked up. So the angelfish, you know, started as the original wild breed of the Altum, which is the classic black stripe, but then it had a more warm, it was like a brown golden color between the bars. And that's really where these uh, fish started. And again, 1906 was when they were finally described as a species and bred off from there. It was pretty quick. Again, right, it even says right here, 1920s and 30s, angelfish were bred, uh, bred in cat- uh, captivity for, for pet usage. Yes. So once they did that, we started having, uh, having different colors past the wild altums. And again, you can still get the altum um, gene out now. It, you can find them in pet stores or not request it. They're very beautiful. They're extremely social and very aggressive. And very expensive. Very expensive. Yes, the Altums, um, there's some new ones that I've seen out that there are the uh, the Dantum al- albinos that are very beautiful. You're looking at 35 to $50 for a small fish. But, uh, you know, a lot of people um, have been breeding them. There's a guy over in Israel just doing a fantastic job. And they're getting imported into this country and you're seeing them a lot more out there right now and stuff so there's such a wide variety uh find your favorite pick it out decide what you want to do and uh and think of it as think of it as a dog people don't want to breed an altum with a standard angelfish that it really crosses the lines they they will breed together don't do it if you have one or the other don't breed them keep the uh, keep the genes uh, pure they do hybrids that's how we got the white one they did not cross with an angelfish they kept them to the original altums the Altums even have the red eyes, so a lot of the traits that you see, like the black angelfish, still pop out from the original Altum. But the colorations that we see now have changed. So the original colors, as soon as we started um, selective breeding, was the traditional silver. It's the black bars with a silver a stripe between them. That went on to make a marble, which has the black with the splotches, generally silver splotches, and then we actually started seeing a little bit orange color from the Altum. And then the full black. And those are essentially the three main colors that we have in angels up until the last, what was it, the 70s when they popped up? Well, yeah, the, you're looking at so many different varieties that people start playing with. And, you know, you'll get 300 fish and you'll get one that, like like Rob said, with red eyes. And they go, oh, that's beautiful. I want to enhance that. And then you, you'll you try to find another one like that and and try to breed your own colors. And that's what people really love doing. And, you know, depending on what color you, you, you really turn to, some colors are much easier than others. Just for instance, what Rob just said that they have red eyes. The red eyes are generally considered almost albino. And there are albinos. And the albinos are a son of a gun to raise for the fact that the babies have such poor eyesight that they cannot find food. And that has been a problem for years and so, hence, uh, when you start trying to raise the albinos, you want to have a, not a uh, completely bright tank, but a pretty well-lit tank, but you want to have put black paper all the way around the tank, and so they can see the orange brine shrimp swimming. And uh, a lot of people have lost a lot of money, again, on albinos trying to breed them, because their eyesight as, as small fish is very, very poor. And so I've even seen problem. people use special lights yes. just so they make them pop. Yep, it, it's 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 a whole new thing. Uh, black angelfish are not as prolific; they they don't breed as often as say a silver. Uh, silvers is where you, is where you want to start if you, if you're a novice. They're the hardiest by far. Yeah, and and they uh, breed like rabbits. Once you get them going, it's hard to get them to stop. So, again, the colorations, those are the, the main types, but there's also, um, again, just standard white that isn't albino. You don't have the traditional red eyes with the with the normal albino. Yep, some people call them gold. Well, that's the other uh, thing. So it blends into, there's either white, which they call pearl, and then they have the gold, which is the uh, silver white with just a tinge on the top of that altum color. So they're going back to the original roots. Yep. And more recently, you spoke about the koi. So they literally have the traditional black, you know, red, orange, white patterns of a koi fish onto an angel. And they're very beautiful, extremely sought after. Yes. 
And, and there is several people that do a fantastic job on them. And you can do your research on Aquabed on the Internet. Um, the one that I've always been impressed with is Steve Rabicki from Angels Plus. And if you want to be bored to tears, he's got so much great information about raising angelfish, and he gets into genetics so deep, you have to be a physicist to figure it out. Yeah, shout out Angels Plus. They've been uh, breeding crazy stock, and they still sell uh, breeding stock. Um, they're real high prices, but it's worth it because, again, it's proven. They've done a few batches, and he'll have unique species, which a couple of them, they have super reds, which are almost entirely bright red across the entire angel, which is a strain of a koi. He'll have half and halves, meaning half the body silver, half the body smoke, or like that dark color. And then you'll literally have another variation of the, the blacks, which are smokies. I've seen as branded in the aquarium hobby, where they're entirely that charcoal color, not black. Yep. Uh, you know, he's been, he was the first person to ever sell fish on the internet. And that's his claim to fame. And he is Mr. Genetic. And if you do business with him, he's out of New Olean, New York. He is a great guy. He will give you uh, all kinds of time. Uh, if you become a customer of his, he'll answer your questions and stuff. Um, but, yeah, his stuff is not cheap. But genetically, probably the best fish you'll ever find. They eat like monsters. He's, he's known for his double dark blacks. And uh, he has actually gotten to the point where he probably had about 20 varieties 10 years ago. He's probably down to about six varieties now because he's concentrating so hard on the koi. So if you go on his website, and most of the stuff, as soon as he gets a pair up, they sell out. He is not afraid of marking up you know, a single pair for 500 bucks. Not, not, and it, it's worth it. And, it's, they're, and they're gone. Because a normal batch, they'll do 40. You know, his will do 100, 100 plus. He'll have you know, the stats on them. He'll have number by batch. It's it's a proven proven breeding site. Proven pair, yeah, and and they probably average. Uh, I've had pairs from him, and they'll average two three hundred fish easy. Uh, I've I've heard that a that lot, much. Yeah, there's people that have, have on the that are on his website that have had up to five hundred per spawn, and uh, he'll sell an average koi. He has three different varieties of koi. He's got a select, and he's got. You know, a small, medium, or he's got three different sizes and stuff. But it, it's not uncommon to spend uh, $75 for a fish, for an adult fish that's ready to go. But consider this. So you, you buy a pair from him, and they're high-end orange, and he you have 300 babies, 400 babies, and, and all of a sudden you go from selling your angelfish from a few bucks to... Now you're top on Aquabit. $15 a piece, you know, for babies. And people will pay for it because he has got a reputation and he does a bang up job. It's fantastic. Well, I think that uh, that dives in for breeding selected colors. The stuff we haven't uh, gone over is a specialized diet. So, again, any, we'll say bread and butter tropical fish, especially the, the, the discus, they love any type of, you know, frozen bloodworm. And the big uh, thing that they use for breeding for discus is beef heart. Correct. Frozen beef heart. So... I have not personally fed these guys beef heart. I know they'll take it. Um, the stuff that I've had is mainly just the... It doesn't take a lot for these things to breed. Do a water change, turn up the heat, and if well, as long as they're paired, they'll just find a way. So there's not a lot of inspiration you have to, but if you do want to encourage them, don't be afraid of those uh, those types of foods. And live foods. Yeah, if you, if you have live food or... Uh, you, you get, Some of the stores in the larger areas sell adult brine shrimp now. And... Uh, to raise brine shrimp to adults don't do it is a lot of work so what i prefer to do is i like to go get a high quality frozen bloodworm or frozen brine shrimp and i've had more luck with frozen bloodworms than brine shrimp and once you get them on to that frozen food they don't even want to take flake but i've got people that that swear that flake's the only way to go and I get people to do frozen food. But I've personally had the best luck from frozen brine shrimp. And um, you'll get them so they're breeding every 10 to 14 days. And you can keep track on, on your tank. Put a little recipe card on there. And let's say um, they breed August 12th. You write down August 12th. And every time they breed, you, you start watching that. 
and after about 10 spawns, you go, oh, yeah, they're breeding every 12 days right on cue. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, here's a place where they they uh, they spawn after seven days. And here's what, here's what usually it is. It's usually a heavy thunderstorm, or in our neck of the woods, a heavy blizzard where heavy low pressure comes through. And low pressure... In, in you know you've talked about people who fish we're from minnesota people love fishing up here for the walleye and when a storm comes in the fish start biting like they're crazy that goes for breeding for a, a lot of uh, the majority of fish i've done absolutely if you want to see something happen you wait for a low pressure system yeah there's uh, fish that are no longer illegal in minnesota called uh, dojo loaches or weather loaches they literally are called weather loaches because they're so sensitive to low pressure systems they will get squirrely and dart around the entire tank the moment that a storm starts to brew. Yeah, it's, it's very common. And 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 so do yourself a favor and and so just jot and here's what's weird. So so you're breeding them in your basement and um I most of my spawns or, or downstairs in the basement, and I have the lights on during the day, and at night I, I, I turn them down. I usually leave one light bulb on so they don't settle to the bottom. And uh, But do yourself a favor and keep track of the weather, and, and you'll go, holy cow. I mean, when, when you've got 25 pair, and all of a sudden you come down, and you got 15 spawns in one day, and everybody's off their That's why you collected pickle jars. Yeah, exactly. You sit there and just go, oh, it's going to be a long night. What's Jim doing in his basement with all these blue pickle jars? That's Meth, right. ladies and gentlemen. Meth, yeah. Meth. That's how he's moved on from, from losing eight grand. Is, is that how you do meth? I don't know. I don't. It's blue. That's all I know. Yeah. It's blue and it's in a basement. That's all that matters. That's right. So as far as food goes, again, breeding, you know, those live foods, frozen blood worms, frozen brine shrimp, if you want to encourage, but you don't really have to. In my experience, you know, because a lot of people go with the micro pellets versus the flake. Micro pellets work great for a lot of fish. These guys will absolutely hit micro pellets, but flake gives their slower fish. Flake gives them more time, and I've just had a lot more success with a, with a flake if you're going to choose a traditional food. A flake will stay right in their, in their system for a longer amount of time. Where, where is That's that? to be debated. You know. All this whole, like, oh, is he constipated bullshit? Just make sure <laughs> it's a tropical fish, high protein. Look where you're getting your, your flake from. If you're going to get, like, some shitty Wardley stuff from Walmart, stop it. You're, you're potentially doing parasites or infections. Make sure you're getting a good high protein flake. That's all you need. And, and there's a million different, there's brine shrimp flake, there's blackworm flake, there's all kinds of flakes out there. Just look at the protein ingredients in the back, and then also, if, if, like any fish, look for ash content. And that goes for any pet. If you have a cat, you want your cat to have a urinary tract infection, don't feed him shit. Look in the ash content in the back. You know, I've been doing the pet industry for over 30 years, and not only sold a lot of fish, but sold a lot of, oh, hamsters, gerbils, stuff like that. You know, over the years, because that's what people were looking for. Because I'm going to the pet store anyway. But I used to get this this great pet product news magazine, and they did a study, and they took the most the number one dog food in the nation is Old Roy. It's most sold. That's a Walmart exclusive. It was named after Sam Walton's dog, if I remember correctly. Is it really? It is. I did not yes. know that. And, and anyway, so it's the number one dog food in the world. And, and, they, and, I mean, for tons amount produced and stuff, I mean, that's the number one. And so they did a study. They, they, they took, uh, I don't know how many dogs it was. It was quite a few. I mean, it was a pretty ridiculous study. And, and they fed 50 pounds of Old Roy, and they fed 50 pounds of uh, some high-end food. And out of the Old Roy, they took out 37 pounds of waste out of the yard from that dog out of a 50 pound bag of food and the good stuff they took out 12 pounds so you know when it comes to pet food what are they shitting out is what's left over right you know so you go from 37 pounds of waste in your backyard to 12 pounds of waste from 50 pounds of dog food and it, it and to that that it just says a lot and Again, we, we can pick brands. My favorite o over time, just because I know the ingredients and I've seen it prove on color, l longevity. I always use new like Spectrum. There's a lot of great independent guys. I think you were talking about Ken's. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, Ken's Fish has got some good stuff. Um, Angels Plus has got some good stuff. There, there's, um, you know, just recently I was trying to uh, do my research because we started raising shrimp and trying to find some, some different... Uh, shrimp foods that uh are out there 
And the best shrimp foods that are out there are overseas, and we can't get them over here. Uh, out of the, a guy just did a, a study on food for shrimp. Oh, we're going to do a shrimp podcast. Don't, oh, don't you worry. Don't That's going to be a good podcast. And anyway, the uh, they did, did this incredible study on, on shrimp food, and the top 10 were all from overseas, and we can get one here in the United States right now. That's insane. And it's $20 for three ounces. Oh, we got some insider trader secrets on, on shrimp. Don't you worry. We'll get to that. But I think the last thing about uh, before we get off food is there's been a, a small trend in the – this really came out from the like the organic area where they're doing like no filter, all plant tanks. And they're doing this with a lot of other fish. They're starting to see success in using this with um, angelfish and other discus is the new vitamin uh, supplements that they have for fish. So if you get, let's just say, a peacock cichlid from your local uh, shit pet store, hashtag Walmart's closed, <laughs> you'll see them have color. You bring them home. They'll seem to, you know, as you're feeding them going over time, their color fades, but they look healthy. They look full. They're, they're getting up to, up to speed. It's because they're juiced. Juiced up. Juicing is so damn common for cichlids. It's, it's almost impossible to find a good real true colored cichlid in the market is if you're trying to go wholesale at all and we've tried we've really tried oh we've bought you know Difference. batch after batch after batch we have people we can get it from but it's so impossible so that's how they are been using juicing for a while is they soak the food in essentially the juicing element and they brighten up the fish so they're now actually doing this with vitamin supplements you can buy online. They do have, some of these uh, supplements do have like, the juicing element. But read your reviews, do your homework, and some of these supplements, if you just soak like a pellet into it, you'll see these things, and you know, not necessarily encourage bread, but you'll see them you know, fix their uh, fin repairs. It'll be uh, essentially your first go-to st- um, uh, supplement when the fish gets sick. So give that a try. And what we'll do is there's a couple, again, Jim and I are trying things all the time, so we'll try to share our insider uh, secrets, and we'll post it on the, the podcast uh, site. But um, we'll put some v- vitamins up there. We're going to try some ourselves, give it a go, and see how this works. And, again, we're not encouraging juicing. We just – anything to help the growth of the fish and the overall lifespan. And, and, you know, anything with a beta carotene will help increase the natural color of the fish. I just feel like if you say be- beta carotene, you have to have the thickest glasses than me and go, in Yandel. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Doctor Oz. No, Beta carotene. He's not. He's not lying though. But yeah, that that's you know naturally, uh, just like if you drink enough Mountain Dew, you'll turn kind of a green. Right. I mean, I mean seriously, you'll 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 uh, have a green glow about you. I've uh, read more. My, my wife's a nurse, and we've read all kinds of different things. And hey, you know, people that eat a lot of carrots turn what orange. I. Don't believe that for a minute. Yeah, well, well, well but I've never eaten a carrot. There so. is a proven fact that if you drink purple, uh, what was it Rockstar? Yes. Yeah, you'll piss like antifreeze. It's pretty great. You got to give it a try. <laughs> if it would only glow in the dark. I don't would... know. It was pretty bad. It's like I should have fed it to a dog that needed to die. That would have been a great bar trick. Hey, come in here. Look at this. Check this out. I'm like, we see your dick again, Rob. Put it away. I, I, I had somebody who... Um, was at a card party out deer hunting, and they ate a pound of blue jelly beans from uh, Jelly Belly. And the next morning... They murdered a Smurf. Yes. The next morning when he went to the potty, he yelled at all the other guys, come look at this. And my friend said he got halfway into the bathroom, and he said, I could see a blue glow in the toilet. So, yeah, what you eat goes right directly in your system, so... Be wary. Be careful what you eat. So back to the subject. So I think the other things that we need to cover is, you know, just general care. So the overall lifespan that you've seen, Jimmy, in angelfish, because you you get these estimates online, but it depends 100% on space, water quality, feeding habits, and breeding. If they've bred or not, completely changes the life cycle of a fish. Absolutely. A lot of a lot of people. In the industry, I mean, they'll burn out a fish just from, you know, if you're laying 300 eggs every 15 days, every 12 days, every 10 days, there's only so many eggs that fish is going to produce. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to let them go for like four months, and then I'd like to retire them and, uh, you know, sell them to somebody else. And if somebody else wants to 
uh, you know, just have him in their tank as a, as a fish. That's great. great. Oh, don't let him kid you. He has a back 40 that he puts him in just because he doesn't want to let some of them go. Some of them I keep along. Cause they're, Damn right you do. They're my friends. But, you know, and to sound like a jerk, I mean, I know a lot of people that do that, but what they'll do is they'll sell the male to one store and the female to the other store because they don't want any competition, which makes sense. That makes, that makes clear sense. Right. But, you know, we're here to help people. We're not here to 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 blow smoke up your butt and and, and tell you things that, that aren't true. We want we want you to be successful in what you do. Well that and I mean he's he's already burnt up his eight grand. There's there's no way he's gonna make it back. He's given up and gone to a podcast. That was the first year Rob eight grand. We could talk about thirty your, years. We, we could this. talk we could talk about the first ten years and you'd throw up in your shoe. It's it, <laughs> it was not good. But, you know, you, you finally get to the point you're going to go, I can't buy this fish from this person because it doesn't live and vice versa. Oh, it? absolutely. Trade, it's not trade secrets. It's experience. Yeah. And, you know, so you, you buy your goldfish from the goldfish people. You buy this fish from this person. And, and all of a sudden you've got five, six suppliers that that you're, you, you like because their stuff lives. So, looping back to the life cycle, you mentioned before, again, they only have so many breeds. But also, on the other hand, let's say you never breed it and you have a female. Right. She's fat. She's egg clutched. Being egg bound for too long, exponentially shortens the lifespan of a fish. Right, and 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 I've seen egg bound fish that look like they swallowed a marble. It, it'll it'll kill them over time. Right, and that, that it's it's not that the guarantee being egg bound will kill them, but it'll certainly shorten their lifespan. Yeah, it's like being constipated for <laughs> your whole life. I just want a nut, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. I just need a nut. <laughs> so again, how long do you, on average, the uh, angels live in your experience. I've had them two and a half years. Come on, I've had, I've seen people now six years. Oh no, really? Yeah. Holy cow! I, you know, two and a half, three years in a community tank. Oh no, no, these were alone. They were their babies. Oh, okay, it was yeah. real weird shit. Yeah, they uh, once they start getting to to that age where they become very territorial, then that's when you usually start having your problems. And the older they get, the more territorial they are. They're just old pissy people that just want you oh, to get the hell off their lawn. Get off my damn lawn. But no, I'd say the average lifespan of a non-breeding male, because again, they're not going to be egg clutched. You know, you're going to see in a normal uh, tank, you're going to see that, you know, five, six years. But they can go up to ten. Seriously? Oh, yeah. Did not know that. Well, it's going to be school today. I, see, you you keep them uh, for breeding, so they only have such a uh, such a life cycle. I, I deal with the uh, long term. Oh, I've been donated a fish. So <laughs> to give you guys a bit of, a bit of background here, um, Jimmy and I opened a business that uh, we had for a while. Tried to sell uh, fish online. We got hosed. Uh, we were working with the post office trying to get shipping services locked down. It was right during that perfect peak time that Amazon decided they're going to go with the postal service for the last mile. So all these little guys that were working on contracts got shut down. So my shipping prices were, well, went up Ex- exponentially. We couldn't ship fish like we we would uh, we wanted to because we can beat anybody's prices during the, the time. But when you want to buy a $6 fish and you have to pay $26 shipping, it doesn't feel good. No. So we, we got out of that. I, you still wholesale. I still help you. And what we did is with the business, it was uh, um, publicized that um, if you have a fish, don't flush it down the toilet. Don't throw it in a pond, for God's sakes. And don't throw it in a lake or river. No. Instead, contact us. Contact the Minnesota DNR. Maybe they can get, we've left our number with them. And in doing that and teaching people, don't do that. That's how we have invasive species, number one. That's how we bring disease to our fish, number two. And it's inhumane. Those fish are not going to survive in, let's say it's not a Minnesota climate. Let's say it's another climate and another one. Well, either they're not going to survive or not built for it, or they'll destroy the habitat. There's no good ending for you dumping a fish. No, absolutely not. And it's not fair to the fish. Oh, absolutely. So what we did is we decided any fish that you have, if I can't hold it in our warehouse... We will find a home for it if I got to call a zoo, whatever else. I have plenty of contacts. Jimmy's been in this thing for 30 years. He's a ton of contacts. And I think the oldest recorded angel that I've had is 12 years. No kidding. It was a big black bull. He was alone. It was just this one guy's pet fish. I think the guy passed away, and his kid's like, what am I supposed to do with it? And he lived another year. That is amazing. Probably died of loneliness. His eyes were glossed over like they had uh, cataracts. cataracts. 
But damn it if he could not smell food. <laughs> yeah, and they they had to uh, splash the water on top to let him know there was food there. It was real weird. You had to get a dogfish for him, like a seeing eye dogfish. Oh, yeah. That's but, incredible. I, I had no idea they lived that long. That's incredible. Yeah, you just got to quit, you know, working your sex house. Well, you know... <laughs> You know, I, I, I'm not the uh, needy girt guy on, on Wikipedia. I'm just out there just trying to hustle and make a buck. I suppose. So as far as care goes, there's always debate, like, what's the opportune space you should use for these? And it depends on how you're going to keep the fish. If you're just going to breed them for short term, have a breeding tank. 20 gallons is perfect for a breeding tank. If you're going to grow these out and that's going to be their, their space, especially in a community tank, you know, give them some space. We don't recommend anything uh, under a 40 gallon. These things can grow... Like take your hand, spread it out. That's a that's a good size angel fish when it grows up, especially a bull. That's a that's a humdinger of a fish, and it's not necessarily gallons that we like to measure, but the overall distance. So angel fish are flat, tall fish. If you can have a you know thirty gallon tank, but it's tall, you can easily have a pair of angel fish live happy. But if you have a hundred gallon tank, but it's real shallow, it's going to be a nightmare for angel fish. It's not real built for it. So make sure that you have, if you're going to do that, their traditional 55 is a fantastic purchase, or a 40 tall is great. That'll keep them uh, long term. Otherwise, you know, you'll see that people say, "Oh, it's too small for the fish." Well, they're only selling it there, and it's only going to be there a week if they're doing their job right in a pet store. So it all depends on how you're going to keep them. Long term is what we like to focus on for care. So 40 gallons is great for angelfish, for a minimum. And um, if you're going to have decorations. Some of these have, like, veil tail issues as well, so they can fray at the ends. If you have a frayed injured fin, it causes fungus, a lot of other issues, infections. So make sure you're not using a lot of sharp decorations, and they love tall plants. If you have, like, a dwarf sage that's growing to the top of your tank, they'll swim between it. Nice, uh, flat um, de- decor makes it real nice. They're not going to cave. They'll, they'll swim, maybe hide in a corner, but give them space where they have stuff in the open, uh, open water. And then the other thing, what is great, especially if you're doing a community plant or a community tank and you think that, you know, maybe I have a pair here, buy yourself a plastic Amazon plant. And the reason I say that is normally they like the whiter, whiter uh, leaves. And they'll breed on it. And they'll breed on it, but you can pull that leaf off. Usually they'll pop off and you can take that leaf off without disrupting your entire. And then pickle jar it. And pickle, pickle jar the heck out of it. So. The other decorations, well, not decorations, the other issues that people say with the community tank, these guys are aggressive. If you have just males and you're so lucky to be able to sex them for some reason when, if they're older, and you have just males and they don't pair off, they're much more docile and you don't have a lot of risk and you can have a diverse community tank without them necessarily whapping or hitting something in defense. If you have a pair, they will defend a corner no matter who comes close. So if you have a... Other cichlid that's non aggressive, a great community partner. If you have a neon tetra, one whap and you'll see a poof of scales and they'll be gone. And you'll start seeing neons just suddenly disappear. Oh, lots of neons disappearing. So when they say that, you know, label of semi aggressive, know when they're aggressive. They're aggressive when they pair and they're going to protect their area. Have a fish that can either handle it or notice it, get out of the way. You cannot have docile, you can't have a guppy, you can't have a neon tetra. Other than if they're not paired. Yeah, if you have a betta or a guppy with a large flowing tail, it's just a target. Oof. Just a target. The, um, you know, back to what Rob's is saying about when the fish are, are pairing off. So if you can't tell the male from the female, uh, and I've had where two females have paired together or two males, and it does happen. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. But what, if you're looking online, you'll see some great pictures. But the best way to describe it is a once they become to the point where they start picking at a slate. Picking at anything. If they're hitting the glass repetitively in the same yes. spot, you know it. Yep. And then you're going, well, I think I got a pair here. And just before they spawn, five, six hours, seven hours before they spawn, they'll drop their breeding tubes, which is right between, between the pectoral fins. And it's not some alien, you know, horror film tentacle that pops up. It's just sometimes it can be as small as a little bump. Sometimes it could be like, is that Wang we're saying here? Yeah. Today? Well, an adult male, his his unit looks like a pencil point. It's it, it's sharp, it, it's thin, it, and it's not that long. See, but, that's why you like angels. You can oh, relate. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Whereas a God, a, you, now he threw me for a loop. I did. I got him unexpected with his pants down. Yeah, yeah. We're sitting, we're doing this podcast naked. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, a, a female will look like a airline tube. I mean, you know, like the, the airline tube you use for your your pump into your airstone. It's not quite as big, but it's more round. It's it's more long. And once you become used to that, you'll be able to, to see when they start. Uh, let's say you have a dozen in a 55 gallon tank and they start spawning off, you'll be able to pick males and females left and right. But after they lay their eggs, the ovipositor goes back up and it's no longer visible. And so you got to kind of, you know, take notes and, and there, it's nothing wrong with keeping a recipe card alongside that tank and saying, well, it's the silver fish with the two spots above its eye. It's hard to keep track of them sometimes. So if you want to see exactly what this is, because, again, we can only describe it. This is a podcast. If you want to see and get the image of, like, what the hell is that? I think my fish has wang. Just go to Google. Um, Google out angelfish breed tube, and it'll be, like, this, the top two uh, picture results. You'll literally see, like, a circle diagram of where they're circling. This is what we're talking about. Right. It's the Wang Chung. The Wanging Chung. Wang Chung tonight. I think we have a title for this podcast. That's right. <laughs> but, yeah, so as far as care, again, just a recap. 40-gallon tank, it's all about height of the tank, so they have places to s- swim in that middle column to top column. Yeah, 20-gallon high is great for a pair. Wonderful. Even a, it, a decent 20-gallon, as long as they have that you know foot, uh, 14 inches, it's great. But again, they're breeding it short-term. You're not keeping them there forever. It's where they're going to um, grow and live out that you want to keep a, a more height. And as far as temperature, you can have these things anywhere from, I've seen 74, even 72 is too a little low in my mind, all the way up to like I've seen ninety two degrees for these things. Yeah, that scares the heck out of me, and I I uh, I don't like going any higher than about eighty eight. If you have a pair that just won't quite get the job done, quite, crank it a little bit, just just a degree or two. Two degrees might take it. You know what? Sometimes a water change. You know, if it's eighty two degrees, do a water change of uh, put a five gallon bucket in of seventy eight, and it will cool it off. It will. Well, they'll respond like it's a natural cycle because in the wild, they breed after it rains. And when it rains, it cools down the Amazon, which, which is where they're from. It's a change. And a pH change. A pH change. And sometimes a water change is they'll go crazy and they'll drop their drop their uh, ovipositors and uh, you'll have eggs the next day. So a lot of people, if you have a pair that just you can't quite get there, try a water change. So I bred angels uh, a handful of times, and every time I did it, I kept the tank at 80 because, again, they had a few other fish in there uh, that I, I wasn't really trying to breed. But I saw them picking, and I turned it up 2 degrees, 82, and they dropped every time fa- faithfully. Yep, just a water change, something a little different. And, and what's interesting is that, and I, I cannot tell you why, but I, I had uh, my whole business was in a basement, and so there was no outdoor lights for instance you know like a window being open but once you have them on a schedule you know keep your your lights on a timer but normally almost 90 percent of the time with me uh i would feed them flake in the morning and then in the afternoon i'd go in there and feed them frozen blood worms and at six o'clock they'd start laying eggs 6 p.m in the evening so i i really believe from everything i've learned that the blood worms was enough to kind of push them over the edge to breed and so in the morning, I'd feed them flake. They'd look at me and go, what are you, retarded? I don't want flake. I want blood worms. And I uh, feed them the blood worms, and they go, oh, here's some babies for you. So the last thing I think is like, or one of the last things is water requirement. So I've kept them hard. I've kept them super soft. And I know uh, being in the cichlids, uh, cichlid family, normally that you think hard. But there's a lot of diverse cichlids, especially discus, that love soft water. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily about what they'll, what they'll be in. Um, know where your stock came from and what they, what they have. If you bought it from a store, ask the owner for what his pH is. Know that you can't really change your pH, but at least give you an idea. Is, oh, it's if you're 7.8, I'm 6.0 at home. You know, Don't just do the 30-minute um, bag transfer. Do a, do a trickle transfer, meaning open that bag, let it float still, and then have a – you can just take a, you know, what, uh, a liter bottle, fill it up with your aquarium water, Take a airline hose, attach it to it, and then just pinch it so it just drips slowly in the bag. And well, you can take your time. Like an IV drip. Like an IV drip. And you can take your time, take you know, two hours if you want, 
as whatever it takes to slowly acclimate the fish from P, uh, pH over. And this is a very hardy fish. It will take a lot of different ranges. Um, notably, we can even see online people have done, I've done 6.0. Um, they say, you know, 6.2 all the way to 7.8. So right. it's a very hardy fish. Don't necessarily worry about it. Just note, you know, what's your pH at your store? This, okay, I have to do the do the drop uh, trickle change. Yeah, for like us, when we go buy fish from like a, a pet store, Sometimes up here in the rural north, you have to drive 75 miles, and there could be a huge difference in water quality. And and big, the other thing that, big time. that Rob was saying about, about trickling in your water into the shop's water, after that point, do not take and pour that water into the tank. You don't ever want to put anybody else's water in your tank. So th- pretend that... You know, this is a stranger, right? And the water represents having sex with that person. That is right. Wear a damn condom. That's right. Don't put your shit in there. Don't put her shit in there. Just yeah, you keep, don't. No. keep everything separated. Yeah. Uh, I, I import a lot of fish, and uh, that's a completely different deal. But there again, you're dealing with pH. You're dealing with them putting in um, some sedatives in the water so the fish kind of are drugged a little bit so they don't uh, pee and poop in the water so much. And so... Uh, you know, I do the same thing like Rob was saying, you know, dripping the water in and stuff. And then I reach in, I'll pour that bag of water through a net in my sink and then put the fish in. And acclimating, you know, spend the 30 minutes rather than spending two hours going back to the damn store to buy another one because you didn't have the patience to do it. Right. Also for care, this is an Amazon species. What do we do with Amazon species, Jimmy? We fill it with almond leaves. We love that. Tannins all day. So you can get tannins from having natural wood in your tank. Um, you can get tannins from, again, the most common way is almond leaves. You can do banana leaves. You can do f- tropical fruit leaves. But also, and again, each leaf provides their own um, different types of bacteria. So using almond leaves is a proven, tested way. But I've seen also people go outside and take oak leaves and get great tannins off of them. You know, do a quick... Uh, um, not microwave. Do it, put them in your oven for like uh, to 120, I believe it is. You don't want to start a fire. <laughs> Fire's bad. Fire bad. You can bake them. I don't. I just make sure they're nice dried out. I'll pick through them. I might even rinse them before I put them in, in the tank. Just make sure we don't have pesticide pesticide shit on them. And use those. And you can even treat them. Take a take your pickle jar. <laughs> God, take your pickle off, jar. Get off my pickle jar, dude. Put your leaves in there. And that's where you soak the water. You can just take your tannins. You don't have to put the leaf in the tank if you don't want to. And you can test the tannins before, making sure that, you know, another fish tests them in a quarantine. You can put uh, put a guppy in there. You know what I mean? They're expensive. Guppies are so expensive. $8,000. $8,000. And, you know, just pour the tannins right into your tank. And for Amazon the, species love tannins always. And for the people who are super lazy like myself, black water extract. Black water extract? You can buy black water extract. I feel like you got some like 1700s miracle no. gear with. Uh, no, there. Most pet stores carry black water extract, which is it has heroin in it. It could be. We don't know. So what is black water extract? Help me out. Black water extract is just again the tannins, but it's already bottled. It's already ready. It's like pouring in uh, a little bit of Coca Cola in your tank, and a lot of the fish like that too. So but that's so expensive. Just... It is, and I like the idea of the oak leaves. And stuff, and and especially if you get them out of your backyard, because you know you know what pesticides or what you've done in your backyard, and take the time. You know, there's other other trees you can do. Do some research online. I know oak leaves work. I don't know what elms do. I don't know what you know your box elder does. Do your homework before. Make sure that you know p- people have tried this. Yeah, oak leaves have been used for a while. And uh, another one that's very popular um, is alder cones. And alder cones is like a little tiny pine cone we have big pine cones up here in the northland now they sell the shit out of these for shrimp they do and the shrimp people love the alder cones they swear by them i've got alder cones in several of my shrimp tanks and the shrimp just go gaga over it and it does turn your tank a little skanky uh, brown but you know if your idea is to keep them uh, breeding or keep them healthy you know you want to keep that keep that in there for them and don't smoke them like you'll find when googling alder cones You'll see some, like, uh, tropical fish people literally, like, try to light them up. Like, dude, cones. <laughs> don't do that. Don't, don't smoke pine cones. I can't believe I have not to say that shit. Thank you, Internet, for exactly. ruining me. Please don't 
use your hair dryer in the shower, dumbasses. <laughs> Please don't invest in guppies and get eight thousand dollars in debt. The first year. The first year. Yeah, year one. Well, I think we got a pretty deep uh, coverage of the species. If we miss anything, let us know on the on the website. And this has been a fantastic first episode. I think uh, we can continue diving in. Let us know what you want. I know we shrimp's the big one on the list. You know, three four years ago, and I and Amazon Amazonas. I'm sorry, Amazonas had a, a crazy thing about shrimp, and I thought, oh, this is going nowhere. People lost their goddamn minds. I was so wrong, so wrong. We we have both become huge shrimp fans. Uh, we're, we both have a lot of shrimp. We, we both have tried many different things. And once you get them breeding, um, w- I, we have a local pet store here that I have sold so many shrimp to. Um, they get, w- when they get new shrimp and they put it on Facebook and, and they sell out. So shrimp have not been a new thing. Shrimp have been done for years. Go years. shrimp. They've had shrimp, a mono shrimp forever. Cherry but again, shrimp. it comes down to what people think looks cool. And the moment it pops up, that it pops up like an Amazonas magazine, and you see these, you know, red, white, does. candy just... cane crystal shrimp. Wow, they have color, and then the hybrid breeding begins because it's very easy once you have good circumstances to breed shrimp. Right, and then the nano tanks are so affordable. Affordable, and you can have several of them on your desk at work. Hell yeah! You know, so this whole industry so exploded in the last ten years. Oh, huge! And unlike the fish where we have uh, any other fish, for like, especially freshwater, we have communities where you can post up, people give their own results, their own experiences, and it's just shared information. It's so fast, and people are seeing so much dollars, even in the smaller hobby. Like, you know, if you're just a, a breeder that does angelfish, you're going to get a few, you know, what, a quarter a piece from out of pet store, 50 cents a piece. You're not going to get a lot of money, but because they're so... Um, how do we say? So niche, that everybody can come up with their own color doing hybrid breeding, that prices have skyrocketed if you go online for shrimp you'll see easy i've seen a 320 dollars single individual crystal shrimp i should buy a bunch like eight thousand dollars worth and just get going and just lose your ass oh but no we'll we'll do a dive in and because of that uh, i just want to get to the point because of that there's not a lot of shared information online of what to do with shrimp the, the do's and don'ts how to feed them you know what's going to encourage breeding what's going to do certain colors how to uh, best call, what you look for in a call. There's so much information that people just don't share as they do with other fish. I think that's going to be like the master episode. We might work our way up. It might be next. But let us know what you want to talk about on our website. And any other notes, Jimmy? No. You know, we're here not being experts by any means, but just trying to share information. We want you to be successful. We, we, We Here's what I don't want. I don't want you to go out and buy a tank go home, set it up, kill a bunch of fish, and go, ah, screw it, and throw the tank in the closet, and then a year or from now... Or in a pond, for God's sakes. Right. And then in the, a, a year from now, I buy it from the secondhand store because you gave it to them, and you've just blown $300, which, by the way, is nothing compared to $8,000. you are not only killing the hobby for yourself, you are have a bad flavor in your mouth, you're going to tell other people, why in the hell would you have a fish? It's a fun, rewarding, relaxing hobby, and a lot of good can come from it, so... And, We're here to help. And you know what else? There's a lot of great, there's a ton of great people that are in the hobby, and they will help you. And it's fun to help the younger people especially because, I mean, when I was coming up, um, there was a lot of people with tanks. And now, you know, with the Walmart getting out of it, um, it it's being exposed. I mean, as much as we don't like the Walmart uh, selling pets. Um, if Walmart isn't doing it, if Amazon can't really touch it, Guess what? I mean, there's business there, but we're more concerned about the hobby. Right. And we're talking from the wholesale perspective. You'll hear a lot of that. That just gives tricks to the trade and experience. But if you've got questions, we're going to try to make a website, a forum to share. And we encourage you to go to any other um, forums. And we'll continue talking about different Facebook groups, different forums, different Reddit feeds, anything to help grow your hobby. And even if we're not the experts, we're happy to go out and get the experts on this podcast. You know, and the thing is, is, is not really defending Walmart for, for, for doing fish and stuff. Because, But here, here's what I did like about Walmart is they, where else do you expose your children? You know, you got a lot of young families at Walmart 
They go through, the kids see the fish, and they're interested. And, hey, mommy, can I get a goldfish? Now you don't have that anymore. I mean, nationwide, they've dropped carrying fish because uh, of all kinds of different reasons. And we've known many people who have lost their jobs because Walmart is no longer carrying fish because they did sell a lot of fish. And uh, but, but now you don't have that exposure for young kids. So where, what do they see? I mean, oh, you know, I see these video games. And, of course, that's, that's where this, this whole hobby has gone to is kids playing video games. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with that, huh, I Rob? S- I still play fish. Tattoo. I know you do. But, you know, as, as much as people want to harp on Walmart, at least it was being exposed, you know, to the, to, the, to the kids. And the thing is, without the kids, we're not going to have a hobby in 20 years. And I won't care because I'll be dead, but, you know. He's here for me. He cares, more, he cares about me getting into debt for eight grand just to feel the revenge. I need a check for eight grand before I leave tonight. Hey, that's our goal. Once we get eight grand, we're, we're going to take this podcast and we're going to the South America. South America. Do. You know, that's another trip. That, that'll be another great podcast. Uh, you know, that's always been a dream of mine to go overseas. And they they have these great, great tours where you go out and you collect fish in the wild. You know, and you have to get your malaria shot before you go because you're going out into the Amazon, you know. And uh, I, I there's some great... Uh, Great stuff out there online. If you watch people that go out and do this stuff, it's incredible. It's incredible. So, again, the point is that the fish hobby deserves to be more than your Windows screensaver. And share whatever knowledge you can. That's what we're here about is to share knowledge. If we're not an expert, we'll go get the expert. Go to our website. Certainly uh, request what you'd like. Uh, if you need help, we'll, we'll be there for you. And we want to grow this podcast. And I think the easier goal, if we want to stair-stepping, is you know, let's get subscribers share this with your friends we want this to be an evergreen podcast so if you want to you know look back and see that there's uh angelfish uh help you'll use go to that episode and uh above and beyond all else we uh w- w- what florida should be a, a before the amazon so we'll uh you know get subscribers we'll get enough we'll do go to florida <laughs> talk go to florida to, again talk to some more uh fish farmers and then the amazon there we, we've made the first episode you got to set the goal set the tone we've done that we've done that Well, thanks again, guys, and we will see you guys next episode. Let us know what you want. All right. Thanks again.